understanding what you're good at, what activities specifically you enjoy, what give you more strength and more energy. This is kind of like strength finder stuff. And then saying, okay, what jobs are out there where I can do those things 50% of the time or more? Is, hey, like, it's okay to take time and say no to a couple positions that are 70% when you really, with a little bit of help and a little bit of more focused energy and work, get a position that's more like 85 to 90%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I think. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of the How to Get a Job podcast. Today, I have a very, very interesting uh, topic for all of you. And, it, and I'll be honest with you, it might not apply to the majority of you listening to, but I still want you to listen because even if this not what you're applying to, this there's a lot of transferable skills when you're talking about when you're pivoting from one career to the other. And this particular topic that we're talking about is what if you work in ministry and you want to transition to working for a company that's maybe for profit, uh, private or, or, or even public company, and you have spent a lot of time in ministry, like, okay, well, how do I use those skills that I learned in ministry and be able to use that in my corporate job? And to do that, I have an amazing person that I actually met on LinkedIn. Most of our guests I actually meet on LinkedIn. And I've had a really good time having conversations, very like-minded. And today we have Todd Linder. He is a career coach that specializes in helping people transition from minister, ministry to the, to, to the corporate world. And he is the founder of Lunch, Lunch Point. So, Todd, welcome to the show. How are you today? Doing great, man. And you're so right. I feel like we're kind of kindred spirits a little bit of, man, we like love the same things. We want to help people in the same ways. We just do it in a little bit different rivers. Yeah. Uh, but, man, just super pumped to be here with you. No, today. no, I love it. And, and like, and, and I was actually, before we started recording, we are talking about how like, hey, like, Todd, I'm going to go and position myself like, what if I was in ministry and I spent the last five years as a uh, as a pastor and I was thinking about, like, I want something new in my life. I still, you know, want to be involved in the church, but maybe not a full-time capacity and and then be able to have those conversations. But I also will obviously will give my, my point of view. But, but Todd, I'll start by saying, like, why do you see uh, individuals wanting to move from ministry to the corporate world? What do you think is the most common reason? And And then we can start from there. Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually, right before we start, I want to just say congratulations to you for a couple things. Um, one, as of the time of this recording, you're close to hitting 300 podcast episodes, uh, which is so amazing. And uh, the second thing is that your face was in Times Square recently, <laughs> which is just so cool. To me, I've I've only ever been to Times Square a couple of times, but it's always like massive companies or big movies coming out. And it's like, and then there's Daniel's face. So uh, just wanted to say congrats. And that's freaking cool uh, before we dive into your question. Um, but well, I just had to call that out. But yeah, to answer your question, the reasons are actually in some ways probably similar to why other people in any job might be looking to transition jobs or careers. Um, and I do think this could be a helpful conversation for anybody who's not in ministry before you just discount it. Because when you're transitioning from ministry into any sort of marketplace or corporate job, it really is an industry change. That's what's happening. And so if you're in one industry right now and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I want to work in logistics anymore. I don't know if I want to work in tech anymore. Or I don't know if I want to work in construction anymore or whatever it is and you're looking to change, I think this could be a really helpful conversation for you as well, because that's a lot of what's happening. Um, but first, it's money is a lot of times the issue. There's a need to, your maybe your family's growing, you're a little bit further on in your career, and you have capped out. There is an earning potential cap in any sort of nonprofit space or any sort of ministry space, but that's true in other environments as well. And so it could be that uh, it could be a responsibility cap as well, where you are in a company or you're in this ministry and generally churches who I typically serve people who are in the church world. Um, 
churches usually have a founding pastor or a lead pastor, which is the equivalent of a founder of a company or a CEO, and they're usually not going anywhere. And so if you want to grow in responsibility and authority, uh, you might need to move somewhere else. And then the other thing is, and this is really true, and it's unfortunate in the ministry world, but it's true anywhere, is you'll see people post about this on LinkedIn all the time. You've probably heard it before, but people don't leave jobs. They leave bosses, mm, Yeah. right? And so a lot of times you're just working for someone who's not a great leader or not a great boss. And in ministry world, sometimes that activates something in someone's mind of, oh, maybe I want to go try something else. And so they're looking to make a transition out of ministry. So those are probably like the three biggest reasons that I no, see. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think about like, uh, we've had uh, individuals to, to, to talk about uh, nurses transitioning to medical sales. It's, it's, it's um, I have a, one of my really good friends who we've kind of grew up in the career coaching space with. He's, uh, he specializes in helping people break into medical sales. And the two main people that he loves working with, like it's like his ideal avatar and client is nurses or teachers. Um, and because like to be a really good medical sales rep, you need uh, to understand the science and you need to be able to educate the doctors about this new technology, whether it's a medical device or if it's a pharmaceutical. And if you're a nurse, you know the science side of it, and we just teach you the sales side of it, like the teaching starts the sales. And if you're a teacher, you know the teaching side, so you, then you just got to focus on teaching you the science side. So it's super interesting because I think uh, that that makes a lot of sense. And it's really common for you, especially now in, in, where, in the age we live now, when we are living longer and we have multiple careers. So it's like you could be a nurse or you could be – and serve a church and be part of a ministry for 20 years, but you're only 60 or 50. And you're like, well, I still got 20 more years because people are working above. Like you're, I don't, there's not a lot of people who are retiring at 65 and whether if they could financially retire, they mentally don't want to retire. Cause there's tons of studies that show like, you know, when you stop working, you kind of, that's when your health starts de uh, declining. Um, but with, with that being said, I have my first question. We're sitting in Starbucks and I go, okay, Todd, you know what? One of the reasons you say, you know, I, I think where I am with my time, where I am right now, I feel like there isn't a lot of gro growth for me. I'm underneath a, a pastor who founded the church, very charismatic. He's super young. He's going to be here for the next 10 years. So unless I want to wait 10 more years, I don't, I'm going to have to go somewhere else. I really like the church. I don't want to go to another church. I, I do think that, you know, based, I have, I have a couple of kids that are about to go to college. So I, I know that there's going to be some bills that are going to come in. Um, so I know I want to make a move. I just don't know where to start. I don't know where I can go. What industry, what jobs, what do I do, man? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> and, uh, what I would, I'd probably follow up with some questions if we're yeah. role playing here and ask you questions like, Hey, do you have any clarity on what job you want to do next? And what I would hear most of the time from yep. the other side of the table is, well, I really like working yep. with people. And uh, I, I think I'm good at leading because I like have yep. led stuff before and I like speaking to people. And here's the, here's the place I think people get tripped up, Daniel, in your position, if you're if we're role playing here, is sometimes, and I think this actually goes for a lot of people when they're changing careers or changing industries, is we think more about what we do as a job in terms of what other people perceive that we do or the results that other people get rather than the activities that we do to produce those results, mm, right. right? And so for someone who's in ministry or a, who's a pastor, what they're going to think about is, well, I talk in front of a group or I work with high school students or I work with kids in kind of elementary school age or I... Make sure that our small groups happen. Yep. But there's so many things within that that actually makes those things work. And so then we start to have a conversation about, okay, what are the things within those like mega kind of macro things that you do that you love? And what are the things that you don't like? So we actually have uh, in our with our clients, we have people make a do like and don't mm -hmm. like list 
of all the activities that they've done. And then we look at those do like versus don't like and say, okay, right here, these are all really, really important things to pay attention to because you might really, really like recruiting volunteers and onboarding them and making sure they're a good fit and figuring out where they fit in the organization, but you might hate sending emails to them. You do both and you get a result, which is on Sunday when people walk through the door, they get greeted at the door, but there's something about that and then we can get to have the conversation. Okay, so what kind of roles do you get to do those activities as the primary job function? And I can't take uh, too much credit for this. There's some really great resources and books out there that have kind of guided my thinking on this. But understanding what you're good at, what activities specifically you enjoy, what give you more strength and more energy, this is kind of like Strength Finder stuff, and then saying, okay, what jobs are out there where I can do those things 50% of the time or more? Mm. That's where the conversation generally starts. And we help people work through that process because that's that's kind of hard to work through on your own. So that's generally where we start before we ever get into any sort of resume or networking or interviewing stuff. It's understand which direction you want to go. And I think that's brilliant because a couple of things you said there that I kind of want to touch on as like a career coach, right? I think it's brilliant that you're taking the time to assess. I think that is the most common step that is skipped because it's like, especially when you're at a point of, of, of being desperate, maybe, you know, in this, you know, maybe you're at a point where like you either already left ministry and you're now jobless or you're just super desperate, super frustrated. And you're just like looking. And so you try to skip steps. And so you go like, okay, let me just go on LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster, and just start applying to any job that I think I could apply for. And now if you do that and you skip the clarity and you skip doing that, what happens is that you then lose a lot of control in the back, in the, in the back end of what jobs you are going to want and what you get. And you might get a job faster, but that job might be just as miserable or even more miserable than the job that you have. And odds are you're probably going to be underpaying yourself because you undervalue yourself. And so never, never, never skip the clarities part. And ne like you should never, and it doesn't need to take weeks to get this clarity. Like you could do this in a couple of days, maybe even a couple of hours. And I, I would even say like, you know, work with someone I, because a lot of times having a third party involved into those decisions will give you a bird's eye view that you won't let yourself in either. A, if you're at a point where, where you're frustrated, what I find is that you're, your, it affects your confidence and if you, it, it affects what you believe. So you might be selling yourself dramatically short and taking a job where you're on like completely overqualified, but because of the limiting beliefs that you are having with yourself and the lack of confidence that you're having, you are missing on really good career. But if you have a third party that says, Hey, look, I know how, you, I know how you might feel right now, but like, trust me, I've seen people way less qualified than you would get this job. You're selling yourself short. And so that's going to be super helpful. So anyways, um, I thought I'll add that. Yeah, I love it. And you posted about this on LinkedIn this morning, I think, which is you have to be thinking through the lens of you're interviewing the company just as much yes. as the company is going to interview you. But when you're transitioning from a from one industry to another, you already feel the pressure of I may not be the best candidate or the most attractive candidate for this job. And so you just kind of like, I'll get any job and then eventually I'll make the next move. Yep. And that strategy will get you there, but it may not get you to the place you really want to be or what you're really qualified sure. for. And so that's a super important thing that you said of, and even posted about this morning is, Hey, like it's okay to take time and say no to a couple of positions that are 70% when you really, with a little bit of help and a little bit of more focused energy and work, get a position that's more like 85 yeah, to 90%. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think um, we forget that there's no such thing as a long-term relationship if it's not mutually beneficial. And you might, as a job seeker, think that the companies have all the leverage but that's not true. And I'm telling you as a business owner with 20 employees, 
I feel like my employees have all the leverage, right? Um, and that's also probably <laughs> not true either, right? So there's, there's this lie is in between. And as long as it's mutually beneficial, the relationship can last longer. And both, I don't know about you, but if you ask, like, I don't know about you, the, the listener, but if you ask, like, if I were to ask you, what do you, what's the number one thing you look for? Like, if I say, what are the top three things that you're looking for? The most common answer is security. Like you want some self of security, right? And then comes pay and then work-life balance and all of that. And if you ask an owner of a company, a manager, a director, what are you looking for in that employee? I want stability, right? Or security. Like I don't want them to be leaving. So you both, both the company wants that, you want that, right? And so it's all about finding that. And you interviewing the company back is actually going to give, it's going to actually make you look really good. It's not even going to hurt you. It's going to help you, right? But also allows you to make an educated decision if you can see yourself here for the next two years. Because you accepting a job, knowing that you're going to go and continue to apply, it's actually going to hurt the company. And so you need to be able to interview them back because it is an equal exchange of value. You are working for them 40 hours a week, but they're paying you for that work. And that makes it the equal exchange of value. Um, and so it's also, all, by the way, side note, it's not all about money because I think you also need to focus about what it, what is the rest of that equation look like? You know, are, are you learning? Is there group room for potential? Does it match your mission and values, right? Like, you know, especially if you're coming from ministry where the primary reason why you're probably there was not the money, right? You probably don't want to go from there and then going and, and go to the opposite and working for a company where the ethics and the mission and the values are completely against you, then you're going to have this distraction. But, and so you probably want to know that too. So anyways, back to you, Todd. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, that's great. And can yeah, I add yeah, one yeah. thing to that, that I think is helpful for ministry people and really anybody who wants to connect purpose to work is I, because there's plenty of people that want that. I think that's innate in us is that we, we selfishly want to help others. Mm -hmm. It makes us feel better. And that's, that's generally like when you see that in society, when you see it in the workplace where the culture is to move towards purpose and move towards helping other people, it's generally a healthy place to work and a healthy, like healthy relationships to be in. It's what you said a few minutes ago about it needs to be mutually beneficial. But I think what's important is, especially for people coming out of this more in your face purpose work is to understand there's there's can be purpose in the work. Sometimes you just don't see it on the face value. And so when you're going in exploring other jobs, it's important to talk to people who have those jobs and ask those kinds of purpose type questions or and say, what is what is it like for you to work for this company? What is it like for you to work in this job? What kind of companies are out there that are your job or have your job in their company, but maybe are a little bit more high purpose and just start to get a playing field because I had a really interesting conversation and it, it was an eye opening for me with someone a couple of weeks ago, which they sell insurance. They sell insurance to corporations. Really great guy. I got introduced by a mutual friend and like, Oh, you need to connect. And he, I was introduced as like the guy who helps pastors get jobs. And my, our mutual friend said, Hey, I think that pastors would love what this guy over here does. His name's Jeb. And I was like, all right, Jeb, what are you doing? He's like, well, I sell insurance. And immediately in my mind, I go, yeah, probably not. I don't, cause that can feel kind of like slimy <laughs> sometimes. Like you're at your friend's house for dinner. Or you're like sharing a beer and it's like, Hey, by the way, you have life insurance. <laughs> like yeah. that can, yeah, yeah, some yeah. people thrive in that. Some people don't, but he went on to explain how it's more than that because what he gets to do is do a little bit harder work, but he gets to help these companies give their employees incredible benefits that someone in the insurance world who might just hit the easy button, like here are three options, choose what you want. He can actually negotiate a little bit and these companies that he works for, they can get immensely better benefits. And that for him is like his version of purpose. His version of ministry is 
man, if something bad happens to your employee, you're going to be able to help them because we've worked through this together. And so you have to be able, you have to go talk to people that have jobs, even if you're like, no, I would never do that because you actually don't know until you get on the inside. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's so helpful. Uh, A couple of things there, like it's like the best way to learn or to understand or to even reach any goals to learn from someone who's done it. So like, as you're gaining some clarity, like, okay, great. I think this is the the, the type of careers or jobs that I want to follow. Don't just jump the gun, go have conversations with three, four or five of them, see the common trends. And like, you know, someone might be like, Hey, this is not the career for you. You're going to have to work on weekends, but maybe you've already used to working on Sunday. So it's not that big of a deal for you. And so if that's the worst part about the job, sign me up. Right. So you don't know that because uh, until you have those conversations of what somebody else might see as negative, you might see as positive. And what somebody else sees as a positive, you might see as negative. And so having those conversations, those discovery calls, those coffee chats, those networking sessions actually are really helpful. So let's go back to it. So we sit down, we're at Starbucks, we got clarity. We've identified like some career paths. What's next? I- I'm, I'm confused. I'm tired. I'm like, I'm really worried, Todd, because I don't know what to do with my resume. I don't have traditional experience. Yeah. That's a great question. And one of the things that you and I connected on this beforehand, so I'm going to like pull some of our conversation. I was listening to some of the podcasts that you've done before. And one of the things you said in the podcast is as career coaches, 80% of what we teach Mm -hmm. is the same because it works. And then 20% is more based on who we're talking to. And so you speak specifically to people who are trying to get into STEM Mm -hmm and a lot of international students who are trying to get into STEM. And so you're gonna speak a different language, but you also have some of that in your background. So same same for me. So I was trying to think, okay, what would be helpful maybe for people to think through um, that might be a little bit different of like what I might say versus what you might say. So I'd also kind of love to hear your thoughts on this, but when it comes to the resume, the first thing that's really important is to be able to translate what you've done into what the company wants to see for the job. And Daniel, I know you've hired people before. What do you want more? Someone who just wants a job or someone who wants the job you're hiring for? The, the job that I'm hired for, and I want someone who wants a career. Right. Not a job. I think that's and so difference. it's in, Right. And so that's like that's like the bonus, right? It's like do you want a job or do you want the job? Or do you want to be doing this for a long time and even be doing it with us yeah. for a long time? And so the first thing that we talk about is, hey, before you like get into your resume, let's make sure that your story makes sense to move in this direction. Let's go back and say like, even back to when you were in college, like what were you involved in? What were the things you were thinking about? Let's track where the themes are that actually get you to this place so that when you can tell your story, people will engage with it. Cause that's this, that's this mystery about how communication works, right? There's something, I think um, I was, I heard this on a podcast. It might've been Andrew Huberman who's, who was talking about this is that when we tell stories, what happens in the brain is the person listening to the story puts themselves in your shoes subconsciously and it activates the same part of the brain as memory. And so they actually relate to you and memory is ingrained in our brain through emotion. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's our most emotional memories are the ones we feel and remember the best. And so when you tell a story, it doesn't just allow, it's not just like, oh yeah, I was engaged. It actually in the brain, the brain switches on memory mode and connects emotionally to your story. So if you can tell a story of where you've been, where you are, and that where you're going is a good fit, an interview or a coffee chat or anything like that, that's going to boost you further than any just piece of paper could. But then you have to connect your piece of paper to that story. And it's really important to show, and the way we talk about it is not necessarily what you've done, but the things that you have improved and the goals that you have hit. And so what the people are looking for is, are you a fit? Basically, do you, are you the person to solve the problem that we're presenting here? So you and I have both hired people before. 
And we know that when we create a position, what we're, we're not looking for just like, oh, I want to add someone cool to our team. <laughs> we have a business issue that we're thinking about. It says the only way we think the, or the best way to, to fix this is to hire somebody for this position with these skills. We believe that's going to solve this business problem. And so if you can show that you have solved very similar problems before and exceeded expectations, and you can show that on your resume, then the conversation is a good conversation that you can have. And then you can insert that story there, and then you become an attractive candidate, regardless of what your on paper background is. It's like, oh, you're a pastor? Like, I don't understand what pastors do. Well, you've shown not what you've done, but the goals you've hit, the problems you've solved, and how you've improved things. Yeah. And if you can start there and line it up to the job description, we were talking about this beforehand, that is that is money on paper. You just printed money right no, there. I love it because, I, and I will add a couple of things of my thoughts on like resumes and kind of everything that you just yeah, said to kind of uh, bring in my thoughts here is every company, regardless of its size, has limited resources. Like, so like whether it's the US government, Apple was worth three trillion dollars or opni with 20 employees right like we have limited resources so every time we hire we're making an investment the company is making an investment because if we're going to go and hire you todd and pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year to be the director of operations for a company right i can't use that hundred thousand dollars for advertisement i can't use that hundred thousand dollars to buy new office equipment new software new lights i can't like I, I, where is so i am looking to say okay so i'm making an investment if i hire todd how is Todd either going to save me over $100,000 or make me over $100,000 in profit? And what you need to understand is that every role in the company either makes, saves, or a combination of those both. And, and it doesn't matter what job you've held. Even if you did a job at a nonprofit in ministry, every job that you did brought or saved money to the organization because I, you can even say, hey, I'm the, I'm the head pastor. How, how am I bringing money? Well, you're asking for donations. You go out front every Sunday and you give an amazing uh, sit, like speech. And that then leads to somebody saying, hey, you got to come to my church. I have the best pastor ever. Well, that person brings someone and they donate money to the church. So that then creates, right? And the other side, like uh, the janitor at the, at the church also does that, right? Because if they're picking up the trash and they're cleaning everything clean, then that's saving people from falling, lawsuits, or also making it look clean so people come back. So you have to understand that everything that you've done in any capacity has either made or saved money. And that's what the resume wants to do because if you can put that sheet of paper and communicate your value on how you solve the problem, how you are the best investment for the role that you're applying to, um, you're going to be able to have a really good shot of coming into the interview and saying, okay, I want to learn more about how Todd did it or how Daniel did it or how – you did it. And so um, that's really important thing to understand. And then the job description becomes your open, like that the answers to your open book test, right? They're letting you know, like, here's my investment criteria, essentially. Here's what I am looking for, uh, for the role. Um, so yeah, uh, this is it's a really awesome stuff. So, so Todd, so like, okay, we have clarity. We got the resume, you know, you talked about story, which is awesome, which is super important in all aspects of it from having like, communicating the, your story through your resume, through your networking, through your interviews, through the whole process, you're, 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 you need to be sharing your story. I, I got the job, right? Do you see that there's a challenge in transitioning or what's next? Yeah, great question. Um, and a big part of transitioning into ministry is the negotiation piece. And I would actually love for you to speak into this a little bit. Um, so maybe maybe I'll like flip the yep. tables on us a little bit because sometimes there's a mentality coming out of ministry that is, well, I should be sacrificing for the good of, the the good of others. So it's okay for me to yep. make less money. And I think this is generally in nonprofit yep. world sometimes. Uh, but there's this like self-sacrificing uh, lay myself down on the altar kind of on the financial side and you, and then you transition into the corporate world 
And just by nature of exactly what you just talked about is I'm saving money or making money. It's offense or defense. The way we talk about it is it's like yeah. soccer or for your international uh, listeners, football. Yeah. When you're on the pitch, there are defensive players, there are offensive players, and there's midfielders. Yeah. And you got to know which of those roles you're applying for. Are you in like legal or accounting or HR defense, on defense? Yeah. If you're sales or marketing, you're on offense. If you're in operations, oh, you're kind of yeah. in the middle. Town acquisition, you're kind of in the middle. Um, so understanding your value prop in that way. But then coming and being able to actually like expect a fair wage that in ministry world maybe was not as fair. Um, so I love, because I yeah. know that you teach your clients this yeah. stuff. So I'd actually love for you to speak into this yeah. a little bit because you've gotten really great success. So like, you this. know, people are like, oh, Deanna, just give me the script. Like, what is the best way to look at uh, negotiation? And I think it's like, for me, better than any any script that I can give you, right? And, and it's understanding why you should negotiate and how to do it in a way that it doesn't jeopardize your, your offer. And the way I want you guys all to think about this is this. If you get a job and you're desperate for a job and you get a job and I pay you $1,000 a month, but you think you're worth 5,000, what's gonna happen? You might accept the job because you're desperate, but you're gonna continue to look for a job. Therefore, three to six months from now, you're gonna leave me. So if I'm the company owner and I have to rehire someone, that's not a good thing for me. So I'd rather pay you more than 1,000. On the, on, the, on the flip side, if you're the best negotiator ever, and I go and I, I, sucker, I sucker you into paying me a half a million dollar job, half a million dollars a year, for a job that really should require $100,000, right? That's what the market value is. You may be so desperate, I like as a business owner to, to hire that person that you might say, fine, I'll pay, I'll pay you the half a million. I'm desperate, I need you to start tomorrow. Come solve this issue that I have. But I also know that I might be paying you the half a million dollar salary, but I'm looking for someone else to do it for 100. And so I'm gonna fire you as soon as I find a solution. So either extreme, right, right doesn't make sense long-term. And I don't know about you, but I, from every business owner that I've talked to and every employee, we want stability. We want security. So it's not about you ripping them off or they're ripping you off. It's how do you find a win-win, right? How do you get paid enough where you are providing enough value for the company to be able to make money or save money to pay for you, right? And so that it becomes a win-win. And so... I say that to understand that it's not about going into a negotiation and it shouldn't be like, I win, they lose, or they win, you lose. It should be, how do we both walk away from this negotiation feeling really good about it? And how do we come up with that overall compensation? And I say overall, because it's not all about salary. You can negotiate so many other factors to make it a win-win. So the first thing that I say to my clients is like, okay, first you need to understand what's your market value for this? Like if you don't do this job, what can they realistically pay for this? And that's a good starting point to understand that. The second is like, what do you value the most? Because you might actually want more free time. And so like, for I give you an example, I work with a lot of international students. Their family is in another country. And so them negotiating $2,000 more, sure, great. But I, if I'm them, if I'm already making $100,000, I'd rather get an extra week of vacation. So negotiating a week of vacation is gonna be more value for you in the long term, anyways. Um, so, so then remember that it's not just salary, right? Um, another thing is saying like, Hey, like, and, then, and also the principle of the role that you're doing, like, if you really see, like, if you're working for like a startup and they're like, Hey, look, but the startups cannot afford to pay me what I'm worth. Sure. Then negotiate equity. Like whatever you don't make in salary, can you negotiate uh, stock equity, uh, you know, opportunity, uh, different roles for ownership, you know? So there's ways to do that. And, and, and lastly, the, the, to kind of say that, so you have, you have your salary you can negotiate. You can negotiate a signing bonus, relocation bonus. You can negotiate um, an opportunity to reevaluate your role. So let's say you go into a role as a as an analyst, but you deserve you you think in your head that based on your experience that you should be a senior analyst. Well, say hey, you know I understand that it's going to be really hard, especially because I'm pivoting industries. Do you mind if we revisit this three months and six months from now? And that way, based on my performance we can then put me in the right role. And you want to do that ahead of time because that you're not waiting a year and a half to two years for a promotion. You're like, you kind of already opened that door and say, look, if I can hit these goals and I can show you that I can do the job that a senior analyst does, 
would you consider me putting me there? Right. So having those conversations, if that makes sense. Also, man, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I was just going to talk about how that was great. <laughs> also, like stock <laughs> options or uh, also like say like, hey, look, you negotiate. So your salary and they say, hey, we can't do anymore. Right. Um, then say, hey, I understand. Would you be able to give me 10 to 20 percent of my yearly salary in a bonus if I hit those goals? If I make you a million dollars, would it be reasonable for you to give me a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars? Right? Like, I, I'm, like maybe or ten thousand dollars. Like that's really reasonable. Like in a corporation, like if, if an employee of mine came to me like, hey, Daniel, I have an idea that's going to generate you a million dollars more in sales based on your profit margin. Right. That's going to be half a million dollars more. Would it be reasonable for you to pay me fifty thousand dollars more a year if I can hit that? Sure, you sure can, right? Like I would say yes to that. I'm paying you fifty thousand dollars, and then I'm gonna make an extra four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Man, I'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars. You know, like like we'll find the 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 win win. And then so so and then so that and then lastly, like I, I don't know, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about this. Is this? Let's say you ask for $5,000 more. To you, $5,000 might mean a lot. But for a multi-million, multi-billion dollar company, that's nothing. That is the equivalent of your son or daughter asking you for $10 to go to the movies. Like, it's nothing, right? And so don't, like, and you'll realize this rather quickly. And if you've worked with money and if you've managed budgets, how dull we become. Like, I remember I used to be like uh, managing like, oh, how much I, I used to do a hundred million dollars in sales for Frito-Lay a year. That's how much my portfolio was. I became numb to millions. Oh, we did $10 million more this week. Like you become numb to it. And so like what happens is that HR also becomes numb to it. So like $5,000 is nothing to them. But to you, when it's in your bank account, like, I've never had a hundred million dollars in my bank account. So I probably no, 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 nobody listening to this podcast either. Right. So I just think I want you guys to think about that. And lastly, definitely negotiate. Understand it's not just salary. I think salary is where you should start because if you increase your salary, that's going to follow you for the rest of the years, but definitely negotiate respectfully. So like, and, and you guys, I'll give you guys a quick little line. It's like, if, if I'm negotiating with you, Todd, you offer me a job. It's I call this the below. Like, I, this is what they tell us in Fear for for management, but it, it applies to salary negotiation. The baloney sandwich method. So you start with positive. Todd, thank you so much for this offer. I you know working for um, your organization is a dream come true. Bread. I was wondering, you know, is there any possible way that we can go from seventy to seventy five thousand dollars in salary? Baloney. And then just finish with positive, finish with bread. The reason why I say that is because, look, I am re I'm not looking for a job. I am looking for a career with your organization. I can definitely see myself working here for the, at least the next five years. And I'm pretty confident. And I, and, and I just, I would feel more confident being here if we can just get to that extra $5,000. So then you got bread, bologna, bread. And if you do it in that manner where it's not like, hey, Todd, if you don't give me that $5,000, I'm out. I'm not taking it but it becomes more of an open door of a conversation. Then Todd, you can say, hey, you know what, Daniel, no problem. Or you can then come say like, hey, according to my budget, I can't do this. Like, I just don't have the budget. I'm already at the top of the range. Blah, whatever excuse they can give you. Then you can kind of say, look like I totally understand. Can we set up some sort of performance budget? Or you can, if you told me like, hey, based on this role, that's the max, like, hey, I totally understand. That's where you can bring in like, can we talk about in a future role that I'm more qualified? So that leads to the role. So that little simple bologna sandwich script can allow you to then go to different conversations. So let's do this, Todd. I'll, I'll kick it back to you. And then from there, uh, we can kind of start wrapping it up. Okay. Yeah, I just want to point out a couple of specific things for ministry yeah. people that I think is really, really important. Um, the first one is when you mentioned that, hey, maybe you might be considered for a role that you're not as qualified for. This is what I hear from so many people who are in ministry. And it's, and a lot of times it's like a, it's half true because a lot of people come from ministry and they have all the people skills, they have all the soft skills because they've had to lead teams, recruit people, deal with conflict daily. Uh, even if they don't want the conflict, they, they get pulled in to the conflict. 
They're, they're managing expectations. So much that's important in working with people, but they don't necessarily have the technical mm -hmm. skills to be an analyst, for example. And so there may need to be a jump to go down, but if you can learn the technical things and there's an opportunity to show off your soft skills, your people skills, your EQ, and you can get that in like a performance reevaluation three months, six months in, when you crush the job, because a lot of people in ministry too are typically working lots of hours, so they're hard workers already, they're working with less budget and they have to be really scrappy. And so there's a creative, scrappy, mm -hmm. gritty element to working in church and working ministry a lot of times, which if you can get the position, your boss is going to love. Every single person I've hired that's been like a little bit like of a creative problem solver and scrappy and get it done mentality. I'm like, yes, please stay. Like, how can I keep you here? What more would you like to do? Like, cause I have other people in the organization that aren't yeah. doing this right here. I would love for you to be able to move into that position. If you can negotiate that kind of, hey, let's reevaluate, because I really do think I can perform at this level, but I totally get that you need to see me perform at this level first. So can we like get three months, six months in, let me crush the first 90, 120 days, and then us come back around this? That could be a really, really huge win. There's a guy I was talking to the other day who's, in his late 40s, head like pastor type role, went to an SDR role, like entry level, bottom of the totem pole role. But because he's had so much of this other really great experience, he just crushed it. And compared to every other SDR, I mean, just blew him out of the water, like double, triple the results of everybody else. And because he was able to talk to his boss about that, he got put on like the fast track to AE like within six yeah. months no, I... and that usually doesn't happen. And he doubled his salary within six months of being there and he made like a third less than he was before. But then within a year, he was making double what he was making at his church job. So I think that strategy in particular, Daniel, is brilliant and would definitely encourage people to think about that one in ministry. And then the second thing that's, I think, a macro takeaway, that a theme that's been through this entire thing, that I think works for anybody, is put yourself in the shoes of the hiring manager throughout the entire process. Yep. If you can think like them, think about their problems, think about the stuff they're dealing with, think about their fears about you, think about their objections that they might have to you, Think about all of the things internally. Think about the fact that they are maybe just as desperate to find someone as you are to get a job. Think about that they have lots of other things going on, and this is just a subsection of their job. If you can get in that zone and try to empathize with that and strategically think about that, if your conversation, if they start hearing themselves in that conversation, they're going to be taken off guard really, really quickly and you're going to progress into this area of trust that's really hard to get to really quickly. And this is the big this is the big piece here is there's this progression in marketing that if you're in marketing world you know this progression. First people have to know you and know what you're about. So think about if you're buying an Apple product. If you've never heard of Apple before, you first have to know okay, who is Apple and what do they sell? Then you have to like them. You have to think they're funny, you have to think they're cool. And so Apple puts a lot of money into making you think that they're super cool. And then if you get their stuff, you will also be in the cool club. Yeah. Like they put a lot of effort into that. But when you start liking their product that or their brand, then you begin to say, okay, does this actually work and, and fill the need that I have? And that's when you move into trust. And so you, and so in marketing, you go through this no like trust progression. And if you can do that, really quickly in your interviewing process, in that whole application process of, hey, you know I'm looking for this job and you know what I can provide for your company. Oh, you like me as a person. Okay, yeah, we can have a good conversation. We're smiling, we're like talking. But the trust comes when you start speaking the language and saying, oh, that's your problem? Totally, let's, let's, like, let's talk about that problem that you have, hiring manager. And trust is where people are willing to spend the money 
That's when I buy an iPhone, when I trust Apple that the iPhone is going to do what it's mm -hmm. meant to do. And I'm going to trust it with my business calls. I'm going to trust it with my phone calls, my text messages, my emails. In the same way, it's trust. It's they're essentially saying, oh, we'll give you a part of our company and we'll pay you to make sure and take care of that company. That's called trust. Yeah. Like if you have kids, you don't bring a babysitter into your house that you don't trust. But what are you giving them? A piece of your family and you're paying them to take care of it. Same thing. So you got to go through that no like trust mm -hmm. progression. And it starts with this theme that we've kind of uncovered here, which is be able to put yourself in the manager's shoes and empathize with where they're at and use no, that in your that's conversation. Awesome, awesome. Todd, so as we wrap it up, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm in ministry and I'm looking to make a pivot. Where can I learn more about you? How can I connect with you? Where can I find you? What do you do? What yeah, do thanks you so offer? much, man. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, the best place to connect with me is on LinkedIn. And that's just uh, Todd Linder or linkedin.com slash in slash Todd Linder. Easiest way to find me, easiest way to connect. I'm, I'm in the DMs there. So just shoot me a DM uh, and we'd love to have a conversation with you. We do provide a full service career coaching consulting service for people who are interested in making that transition. Everything from, you don't know what you want to do. We're going to help you figure that out to resume writing, LinkedIn, interviewing, networking, the whole gamut. Uh, and some of that's even been influenced by your host here, Daniel, who just in the couple of times that we've talked has just transformed our business in so many ways. So uh, if you like Daniel's stuff, you might like our stuff because uh, no. <laughs> he has influence into it for sure. That. Look, look, guys, listening to this, like, I, I think I say this all the time. I think the question is not, should you use a career coach? I really think it's like, which career coach should you use? And I think to me, and, and Todd, you said this earlier, I, you, you talked a lot about how, you know, 80% of what I'll teach you or Todd teach is going to be about the same. That 20%, right? It's like, you know, everyone, you need a resume. You're going to need to have clarity. You need to need network. You know, you're going to have to interview. All of that's going to be very similar. You're going to have to have a salary negotiation, right? Most of that's going to be very similar. There's a 2080 rule. There's 20% of it that's going to be very unique based on your situation, your background, your goals, your timeline, things like that. And that, to me, is where the different career coaches come in. Right. That's where if I'm in ministry and you're, and you're in ministry looking to make a pivot, don't come to me. I'm not the best coach. You should go to someone like that. You should go to Todd. Right. Right. Um, if you're an international STEM student that is looking for help to stay in America, then that's where I shine. Right. And even though there's a lot of overlaps of what Todd and I do. Right. That particular niche and how you solve that for the particular person is different. It makes it different. And so. I, I'll wrap this with saying, if you are listening to this and maybe you're not uh, in the ministry world, you're not part of a church, but you know someone that is that, and, and you've heard them talk about how they're looking to pivot, share this episode, right? Share Todd's profile. We'll put the links to, to Todd's information, that his LinkedIn included on the show notes. Um, and if you're looking for a coach, even if I can't help you, what we have done actually, because we brought in so many great coaches throughout, if you fill in the, the, the Google sheet that we have below, right? And you just say what type of job you're looking for, maybe a little bit about your background. What we can do is we can point you into the right coach that we can do. We can recommend you a coach that actually uh, fits for you. Again, very clearly on who I help, and I, m odds are I can't help the majority of you, but odds are is I know someone that can. And so um, that's why I kind of want to create that system for you. So again, thank you guys so much for, uh, for listening. Uh, the best way to add value is to share this with your friend, like subscribe, leave us a review. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for being uh, followers and listeners of the show and catch you guys in the next.